Hi there, Prakaptan. Welcome back. I am glad you're here. Today, we're visiting one of Seneca's letters, as is our wont to do on Tuesdays. And today it will be, let's see here, letter 107, entitled On Obedience to the Universal Will. And rather than beat around Seneca's bush, again, gross, let's dive in with both hands empty and grab two birds. Where is that common sense of yours? Where is that deafness in examining things, that greatness of soul? Have you come to be tormented by a trifle? Your slaves regarded your absorption in business as an opportunity for them to run away. Well, if your friends deceived you, for by all means let them have the name which we mistakenly bestowed upon them, and so call them that they may incur more shame by not being such friends, If your friends, I repeat, deceived you, all your affairs would lack something. As it is, you merely lack men who damaged your own endeavors and considered you burdensome to your neighbors. None of these things is unusual or unexpected. It is as nonsensical to be put out by such events as to complain of being spattered in the street or at getting befouled in the mud. The program of life is the same as that of a bathing establishment, a crowd, or a journey. Sometimes things will be thrown at you, and sometimes they will strike you by accident. Life is not a dainty business. You have started on your long journey. You are about to slip, collide, fall, become weary, and cry out, oh, for death. Or, in other words, tell lies. At one stage you will leave a comrade behind you, at another you will bury someone, at another you will be apprehensive. It is amid stumblings of this sort that you must travel out this rugged journey. Does one wish to die? Let the mind be prepared to meet everything. Let it know that it has reached the heights round which the thunder plays. Let it know that it has arrived where, quote, Grief and avenging care have set their couch, and pallid sickness dwells, O drear old age. End quote. With such messmates you must spend your days. Avoid them you cannot, but despise them you can, and you will despise them if you often take thought and anticipate the future. Everyone approaches courageously a danger which he or she has prepared themselves to meet long before and withstands even hardships if they have previously practiced how to meet them. But contrarywise, the unprepared are panic stricken even at the most trifling of things. We must see to it that nothing shall come upon us unforeseen. And since things are all the more serious when they are unfamiliar, continual reflection will give you the power, no matter what the evil may be, not to play the unschooled boy or girl. My slaves have run away from me. Yes, other men have been robbed, blackmailed, slain, betrayed, stamped underfoot, attacked by poison or by slander. No matter what trouble you mention, it has happened to many. Again, there are manifold kinds of missiles which are hurled at us. Some are planted in us, some are being brandished at this very moment and are on the way, some which were destined for other men graze us instead. We should not manifest surprise at any sort of condition into which we are born and which should be lamented by no one, simply because it is equally ordained for all. Yes, I say, equally ordained. For a man might have experienced even that which he has escaped, and an equal law consists, not of that which all have experienced, but of that which is laid down for all. Be sure to prescribe for your mind this sense of equality. We should pay without complaint the tax of our mortality. Winter brings on cold weather, and we must shiver. Summer returns with its heat, and we must sweat. Unseasonable weather upsets the health, and we must fall ill. In certain places we may meet with wild beasts, or with men who are more destructive than any beasts. Floods or fires will cause us loss, and we cannot change this order of things. 
But what we can do is acquire stout hearts worthy of good men, thereby courageously enduring chance and placing ourselves in harmony with nature. And nature moderates this world kingdom which you see by her changing seasons. Clear weather follows cloudy, after a calm comes the storm, the winds blow by turns, day succeeds night, some of the heavenly bodies rise and some set. Eternity consists of opposites. And it is to this law that our souls must adjust themselves. This they should follow. This they should obey. Whatever happens, assume that it was bound to happen, and do not be willing to rail at nature. That which you cannot reform, it is best to endure, and to attend uncomplainingly upon the God under whose guidance everything progresses. For it is a bad soldier who grumbles when following his commander. For this reason, we should welcome our orders with energy and vigor, nor should we cease to follow the natural course of this most beautiful universe into which all our future sufferings are woven. Let us address Jupiter, the pilot of this world mass, as did our great Cleanthes in the most eloquent lines lines which I shall allow myself to render in Latin after the example of the eloquent Cicero. If you like them, make the most of them. If they displease you, you will understand that I have simply been following the practice of Cicero. Lend me, O master of the lofty heavens, my father, withsoever thou shalt wish. I shall not falter, but obey with speed, and though I would not, I shall go and suffer in sin and sorrow what I might have done in noble virtue. I, the willing soul, fate leads, but the unwilling drags along. Let us live thus and speak thus. Let fate find us ready and alert. Here is your great soul, the man who has given himself over to fate. On the other hand, that man is a weakling and a degenerate, who struggles and maligns the order of the universe and would rather reform the gods than reform himself. Okay, so this letter is easily one-third of Stoicism all summed up. It is, so far, my favorite letter in truth. I keep having those favorites, don't I? Oh well, so it is. Let's listen again to four parts of this letter, this time individually. First, With such messmates must you spend your days. Avoid them you cannot, but despise them you can, and you will despise them if you often take thought and anticipate the future. My father used to say, the world is full of buttheads, Tanner. Don't be one of them. Of course, my father's words were slightly different. You can probably imagine what he said instead of buttheads. I won't say it here, but Seneca is saying something similar. The people you exist beside will be many in number. They will be varied in quality, the lot of them. And they will not always please you, or not always be kind to you, or they may even betray you, mislead you, be aggressive toward you. Some may even ensnare you with sweet trappings before you've discovered they've set a trap around you. This is the world. It's a mixed bag. And if you're always living in a state of anticipation about what the future will bring, you will constantly despise the world, because you will be thinking about what crappy things the world might do to you, how terrible things are bound to happen, and how woe is you and your lot in life. If, instead of anticipating and worrying and future-gazing, you simply accept what is likely to be inevitable, You will cease being a despiser of others, of the world, of the gods, whatever you prefer. You will cease to have your attitudes and moods controlled by the actions of others. You will cease to grant them that power. And so you will cease to be in a state of despising hatred. But let's go further. We must see to it that nothing shall come upon us unforeseen, and since things are all the more serious when they are unfamiliar, continual reflection will give you the power, no matter what the evil may be, not to play the unschooled boy or girl. Nothing that happens to us should be unexpected, or as few things as possible if we're diligent in paying attention, in recognizing what is likely to come to pass. 
If we're honest about the shortcomings of ourselves and others, we can stop being mad that others aren't perfect or that things shouldn't happen, and that if people were just better, the world wouldn't be this way. And we can begin instead seeing those things that happen to us as more likely, perhaps inevitable, indifference, and cease allowing things to take us by surprise. Someone slurs you? What of it? Is this a surprise, knowing how unimportant the development of a virtuous character is to so many people? Of course not. A person dies. Is this a surprise? People are mortal. There's no promised amount of time, is there? When people die, then, why are we so often moved outside of our minds? I don't mean why do we miss people. I don't mean we can't feel the lack of a person's presence and be moved to sadness over it. We can feel sadness as non-sages. But why do we act as though the death itself is unfair? Why are we moved to rage, self-destruction, or ideas of revenge? Is it because perhaps the death came early? Early according to whom? Was there a contract that promised something longer? Do we feel the same when people live too long? Do we get up in arms about the fact that Grandpa isn't dead yet? Or perhaps the death was unjust? Well, then seek justice by all means in appropriate ways, but don't let the realization of death's certainty take you by surprise. Don't be surprised by death, and don't be surprised by the viciousness of man. Instead, know these things will happen and be better prepared to deal with them appropriately when they do happen. Of course, that's a sage position, isn't it? A sage would lose their child to a terrible disease and accept it as simply part of how living works. Death is part of it. I'm not, personally, Tanner Campbell, the guy talking to you right now, saying that if someone murders your child, you shouldn't be enraged. I'm saying the Stoic sage wouldn't be enraged. And part of Stoicism is working towards being a sage, so even if we know we'll never be sages, it's important to remind ourselves of how sages would behave or how we reason they would behave because it gives us a horizon to continually strive towards. If I had a child and they died, I would be devastated. Stoicism would help me from slipping into madness, and it can do the same sort of thing for anyone willing to adopt a stoic position on death, even if that is an imperfect stoic position. Lastly, Seneca writes, we should not manifest surprise at any sort of condition into which we are born, and which should be lamented by no one, simply because it is equally ordained for all. Yes, I say, equally ordained, for a man might have experienced even that which he has escaped. And an equal law consists not of that which all have experienced, but of that which is laid down for all. Be sure to prescribe for your mind the sense of equity. We should pay without complaint the tax of our mortality. This is essentially the dog in the cart. What are we surprised by? What are we fighting? We are living, which means we are dying. And whether we accept this and jog alongside the flow of time or lay down and insist it is all terribly unfair and don't we wish it were different, we are still in the process of dying. We're just dying in misery and sadness instead of in appreciation and as much joy as we can muster. Everything that can happen to a human can happen to any human. Cancer, poverty, loss, pain, all of it. Even those specific things like being held up at gunpoint at 3 a.m. while standing in your front yard with your dog whose incessant whining to potty puts you in the front yard in the first place. That could happen to anyone. It won't happen to everyone, of course, but it will happen to some, and so if anything can happen to anyone, how arrogant are we in our expectations that anything under the umbrella of everything shouldn't happen to us specifically? How stupid. What gives us the right to expect a life without negatives, or, for that matter, without positives? What gives us the arrogance to expect that the things which happen to us are only the things we want to happen to us? What are the mathematical odds of anything going our way any day of our lives? I want X to happen, but one billion other things could potentially happen, and I'm mad when X doesn't happen? Am I silly? Why would X ever happen, let alone why would we expect that it would? How could we be so entitled in our expectations? We should pay without complaint the tax of our mortality. 
I really like that line because what does tax evasion in this sense do to change what happens ultimately? You not wanting to be sick will not make you healthy. You wanting to live until 90 won't stop you from dying at age 40, and you wanting to die at 40 won't prevent you from living till 90. So what are we kicking and screaming for? Temper your expectations, be realistic, it will prepare you for your life and give you back all the time you'd otherwise lose fretting over uncertainty. Thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you'd like to share your thoughts, which I'm thinking after this one you might want to, join our Discord at stoicismpod.com forward slash Discord for free. If you missed our recent workshop on Stoicism and food, you can catch the rewatch, by the way, I'm just mentioning, at rewatch.actualstoicism.com. And if you'd like to attend a future workshop, always keep your eye on actualstoicism.com. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care.